God wants to do something here now. I was just kind of been just praying a little bit over there. And he wants to do something here and now. He wants to do something in you. What's your name? Mauricio. Mauricio, he wants to do something in you tonight. What's your name? Peter. Peter, he wants to do something in you tonight. He was telling me he wants to do something here. What's your name? Marcus. Marcus, he wants to speak to you tonight. He will. All you got to do, I'm going to do it too. Let's give him an hour. <clears throat> Let's give God an hour to do something in us tonight. I'm going to share with you something that changed my life, radically changed my life, and I'll get into that in a little bit. I would not be here today, and there's something within me. I just did a parish mission to elderly couples, 70 years old and 80 years old, and I, and I said, you know, if you ask me why am I here, I would honestly say I have no idea how I got here. But there's something within my heart that has to speak about what I'm about to speak. He wants to do something in all of you tonight. So let's give him this hour. We, as he brilliantly said, we are in a crisis of identity. We want to change culture. The root word of culture is the same as cult. It's cultus, the Latin. It actually means a society's expression of who they think they are before God. That's the meaning of culture. So we see it in song and dance in the way we dress, the way in which we talk. It's all expressing who we really think we are, human identity. And what the world says is you are whoever you want to be. Walker Percy, an American novelist, one of my favorite quotes says this, despite great scientific and technological advances, man has not the faintest idea of who he is or what he is doing. I've thought of that before. Who the heck am I? What the heck am I doing here? We have no idea who we are as a culture. Who, raise your hand if you've heard of John Paul II's Theology of the Body. Raise your hand if you have not. Okay, awesome, a couple people. Just a brief overview, Pope John Paul II from 1979 to 1984 addressed to the world these Wednesday audiences to answer two questions. What does it mean to be human? And how can I live in a way that brings about true happiness, identity, vocation? you do not know who you are, then you have no idea the trajectory of your life. And in the midst of the sexual revolution, the sexual chaos that exploded, he came in and said, all right, the whole world's talking about sexuality, the meaning of male and female. It's time for the Catholic Church to get to work. And he went on stage in front of the world and announced the beauty and truth of what it means to be human, male and female. In the early 1900s, the divorce rate was 5%, 3 to 5%. 1970, 53%. Today, 32%. You'd be like, huh, I thought it was still 50. It's actually 32%, but the marriage rate, the amount of people getting married, has dropped 50%. Most people are not getting married. We're going to talk about what it means to be human. And the church says... There's this longing in the human being that no crocodile, no penguin, no squirrel has. We have this innate longing in our being, in our bones, for something more. We can look up to the sky. We can ask the big questions. Raise your hand if you've ever seen the movie Dead Poet Society. Dead Poet Society, Robin Williams is the main actor. I'm gonna quote another Robin Williams movie later. He's one of my favorite actors. He is a poetry teacher to high school students. And in this one scene, he invites all the high school students to huddle up. He says, huddle up, huddle up. And he gets on one knee and he says, we don't read and write poetry because it's cute. We read and write poetry because we are members of the human race. And the human race is filled with passion. He goes on to say, law, business, medicine, engineering, these are noble pursuits and necessary to sustain life. But poetry, beauty, romance, love, this is what we stay alive for. And I don't know if you knew this, but the Catholic Church says that that longing, the passions that we have for love and union and life 
is at the core of what it means to be human. The church says the Catholic, every human being is on a long pilgrimage of desire. That's what Pope Benedict says. Religion is a pilgrimage of desire, of longing. I'm going to share a little bit about my pilgrimage with you. It all began in second grade when I caught Maggie's eyes. I was in second grade in the classroom, and there was Maggie sitting down. And my best friend liked her very much, too. And we sat right next to her, crisscross applesauce, listening to the teacher. I'm on one end, he's on the other, and she's kind of leaning back and has her arms kind of out. And I grab her right hand, and my best friend grabs her left hand. And we're holding her hands, and she's smiling, she's laughing, she's having a great time. And then we go to library class. What happens in library class? Okay, we got some free time. My friend Brayden comes up to me, Brendan, I just kissed her. I'm like, whoa, 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 what? Did you just say you kissed her? He's like, yeah. Where'd, where'd you kiss her? Did you kiss her on the cheek? Did you kiss her on the lip? No, no, no. I kissed her on the back. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> and then he comes back later, Brendan, I kissed her right there. I'm like, no way you did. Show me. <laughs> so what does he do? He goes and shows me. No joke. We're sitting, listening to the librarian read to us, and we're all sitting down, crisscross applesauce. He kisses her on this cheek, and I kiss her on that <laughs> cheek. Boom, boom. And the librarian, after when we were checking out books, no joke, said to us, smiling, I saw you guys. You guys had a great time, didn't you? And guess what? We did. We did. I'm not going to lie. We did. But hold on. We're in second grade now. There's innocence. There's innocence. But what happened in second grade? And now actually when I go back, it actually probably started in preschool when I caught uh, these twins eyes. But what happened in me? What happened in me when I saw something so captivating? It awakened something in my being, not only my heart, in my body, I was feeling something in my whole entire self for something I couldn't describe. And it doesn't go away ever. It only grows. Middle school, high school. Then it was my girlfriend. And what did I do? I took my longing I desired for love and intimacy in life, directed it all towards her. And it backfired. What got in my head, I was raised Catholics and two things you shouldn't do. One, you, you wait till marriage. Why? Because that's what you're supposed to do. Okay, okay. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Two, I want to do all these things. I want to, but the church says I can't. Wrestling in myself. So I kind of dipped my toes in the waters, if you will. I didn't fully dive into the deep end in my relationship with my girlfriend, but I definitely dipped my toes in. Was not living a perfectly chaste life. And I ultimately told her, because I knew it in the depths of my bones, because I, I wanted to do God's will. I did, but I knew it in my bones. I was using her. What is to use a person? It's to treat them as an object for one's own selfish gratification. And I ended up telling her one day to her eyes, I'm using you. And she cried. Why? We instinctively know, unless we are numb, that when we are used, it is a degradation of our humanity. I'm not going to lie to you, I did love her, but I did not love her perfectly, I never will. But that relationship ended. I was, sinking, I was seeking, ultimately, God in a creature. I was wrestling with these things all throughout college then. I finally came to the point, I want to live a fully Catholic life. I was living kind of a double life in the fraternities, partying on the weekends, going to mass on Sunday. It wasn't until I, had the, I did this internship with the Theology of the Body Institute with President Christopher West, who has never heard of them before. Okay, handful of people. I'm going to tell you what happened to me. So I go to do this internship with them. Don't even know what the theology body is all about. I actually thought it was all about this chastity talk. Hey, you know, you're a good person. You have dignity. True. But I thought it was theology of the body is all about chastity. How to live chastely. 
So I'm with my employees and they said, Brennan, you're about to go on this course, this 30 hour head and heart immersion course. You're going to get destroyed. You're going to get destroyed. And I'm like, okay, well, I go to mass pretty much every day. And what's up, right? I pray a holy hour every day. I'm reading constantly. I know my stuff. I didn't say that exactly, but this is kind of what was going on. And they're like, all right, all right. And so I gave God 30 hours of my time. I said, all right, Lord, I'm opening myself. I'll never forget, I'm in the back row. Christopher West was the teacher. And he starts by saying this. He says, I want you all to imagine something so beautiful that it takes your breath away. It could be a starlit night. It could be a sunset. I want you to imagine something that has captivated your heart so deeply. I was imagining a sunset. And he says, C.S. Lewis says this. We don't want to just see beauty. We want something more. We want to unite with beauty. We want to take it into ourselves. We want to bathe in it. We want to somehow eat it and become it and radiate it. And he pointed over to the tabernacle and he said, do you know what this is? And I just cried because it clicked for the first time of my life. All the beauty of creation, God created and he said, it. behold, it is very good. He didn't say, behold, it's God. It's good that points us to God. It's beautiful that gives us little glimmers, little tastes, appetizers of the infinite one who is all beautiful. And we believe as Catholic Christians that the word was made flesh, that infinite beauty was made flesh. And he said, take and eat. And in that moment, I knew, oh my gosh, I'm not crazy. This longing I felt when I saw Maggie's eyes. My girlfriends, when I was captivated by them in the beginning, all of these things that wooed me were always leading to him. And I can go. If I'm not working too much or studying and my schedule's not busy, I can go consume infinite love and beauty every day. Oh my gosh. The church gives this desire a name that we feel in our hearts. Eros. The Greeks called it Eros. It means the longing for infinite love, infinite union. John Paul II says eros, which is translated in English to erotic, is actually a good word. He says eros, John Paul II says it's the Pope, celibate man, okay? He says eros is the upward impulse of the human spirit to what is true, good, and beautiful. That's eros. This is what Pope Benedict says. This is what I learned at this course. Man's aching desire for the infinite is like a signature imprinted with fire in his soul and body by the creator himself. The heart's thirst and the body's longing cannot be erased from man's heart. Even when he rejects or denies God, the thirst for the infinite that abides in man does not disappear. Instead, he begins a desperate and sterile search for false infinites that can satisfy him just for the moment. That's what the sexual revolution gave us, freedom to indulge. But guess what? It's not, it doesn't actually fully fulfill you because you go back and you need more and then you need more and you need more. They gave us sexual addiction. It's not sexual freedom. My mentor, who's Christopher West, he says this, freedom is not to indulge your compulsions, but it's the freedom of the compulsion to indulge. It's freedom interior freedom and guess what why it changed my life to be completely honest with you it's because as a man i thought i couldn't help myself but to lust i thought that's just men and i'll do my best until until and i'll wait until marriage i'll do my best but for the first time in my life as this he was breaking open this theology of the body my eyes began to be opened jesus says they look but they do not see they listen but they do not hear and that was me. And sometimes it still is me. But he took off something that was on my eyes, this hardness of heart. I began to see, no joke, I'm not kidding you, images of God in every human person that revealed God. And I was like, oh my gosh, it's freaking real. And I have to tell people about it. It's real. I 
promise it's real. So, what's unique about the human being is we long for love and intimacy. And again, it's not just in our soul, as I said. Just a little teaching. The human being, by definition, is the unity of body and soul. We're the unity of body and soul. We're not spiritual beings within a body. Spiritual beings are angels. We are human beings. We're not spiritual beings. We're the unity of matter and spirit, body and soul. And God looked at all this creation. He, it was a firework show. Think of a firework show. He launches the first one. Earth, stars, sun. Behold, it is very good. The grand finale of all creation is you. The human being, male and female, naked without shame. Male and female in the image and likeness of God. What does that mean? Who has God revealed himself to be? Love. God the Father is totally giving himself to God the Son. From all eternity, God the Son is totally, from all eternity, receiving his love. And through their giving and receiving of love, spirates the Holy Spirit. He created us in his image and likeness male and female and masculinity is a call to what give the seed of love chiseled in femininity to receive that and through their giving and receiving of love properly understood comes forth god willing a third and when this is properly understood of love it's an image of the god who is fruitful love Did you guys just hear that? Did you guys just hear that? The union of man and woman in one flesh is the greatest image, icon, window into the mystery of who God is. If that's the case, if that's the case, where is the enemy going to destroy marriage and family? Absolutely. He is going to erase the meaning of the body. If the body reveals ultimate meaning, God himself, the devil will want to make it meaningless. That's what we have today. I was usually, I tell this to people, do you know that you're the most beautiful in all of creation? The actual word good, behold, it's good in Hebrew is tov, pretty cool, means it's beautiful. Behold, it's very beautiful. It's actually good to see. It's appealing to the eye. And I tell people this, if I'm on the plane, I'm talking to people about this. If I'm in an Uber, I'm talking to people about this. I was in an Uber in Washington, D.C., where I got my studies. And this woman, what are you studying, Brendan? Well, I'm studying this thing called theology of the body. What the heck is that? Well, then I asked her, do you have a faith? Because if you have faith, then I can speak some theology, some you know, Catholic language to you. She said, no, I'm not. I don't have a faith. So I said this. What would the world be like? If we looked at every single human person the same way in which we see a sunset. Because the human being is the crown of all creation, the most beautiful. And she said, oh my gosh. Yeah, the world would be so much different. I usually tell that story when I teach. And one student from WSU, he's now a, a law student at Gonzaga. He came up to me and said, Brendan, Brendan, you would be so proud of me. I'm like, what's going on? He's like, I've been telling that story about your Uber drive to everyone. You'd be proud of me. And he's like, I have a story for you that I want to tell. I'm like, okay, let's hear it. He's like, so I went to a bar after classes with some of our classmates. And I was talking to this woman and she then told me, hey, Ken, can you walk me home? It's, it's dark out. I don't want to walk home alone. And he said, yeah, I'll walk you home. So he walks her to her front doorstep and she says, Ken, do you want to come inside for some tea? He said, huh? What he was thinking was, huh? What is she wanting? But yeah, the tea sounds great. I'll come inside for some tea. So he goes inside for some tea and he is trying to see her. He is trying to see her. And she said to him, Ken, you have a gaze about you. Your gaze is piercing. What is that all about? And he said, what if we all looked at one another the way in which we look at a sunset? And she started to cry. 
She started to cry. Why? The greatest desire, St. Augustine says, of the human heart is to see and to be seen. In other words, it's to know and to be known, to love and to be loved. That is the greatest desire of the human heart. And when we are not seen, we know something happens. What do I mean? I've had many people, every one of us have had many people who may kind of just kind of look at you, maybe just look at some parts of you. And what it does to you is it makes you believe lies about yourself. It makes you believe I'm not seen. No one cares. I'm not beautiful. It makes you believe lies. And we're going to get into what you do with those in just a moment. What has happened, though, with the fall is, oh, my gosh, that perfect vision, Brendan, of man and woman, image and likeness of God, loving as God loves. John Paul II says the body has a spousal meaning. It means it has a power to express love where the person becomes a gift and through this gift fulfills the very meaning of his existence. Wow, Brendan, I want to love like that. I want to become a gift. But, oh, my gosh, if you knew what was going on in here, oh, if you knew what was going on in here, we all got messes, but we love there. But we have a couple options of what to do with this power that I was talking to you about. Have you ever seen the movie Frozen? Frozen. Who has not seen the movie Frozen? You've seen the movie Frozen? Yes. Frozen. We have Elsa and Anna. Elsa accidentally hurts Anna. She has these powers within her. And what do the parents do? We got to take them to the wise trolls. So they take her to the wise trolls to see what's going on. And the trolls, they're trolls, right? I think they're trolls. The troll says this, um, Elsa, Elsa, come over here. Your powers, they will only grow. There's beauty in them, but also great danger. You must learn to control it. Fear will be your enemy. And then what if her parents say, well, lock her up. No one will ever know about her powers. In other words, stuff it, repress it. And she was locked away for many, many years. And then all of a sudden, those powers started going out everywhere. And she sings this. Don't let them in. Don't let them see. Be the good girl you always have to be. Conceal. Don't feel. Don't let them know. But now they know. Let it go. Let it go. Can't hold it back anymore. And then she goes on to this. Listen to these words. It's time to see what I can do to test the limits and break through. No right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free, let it go. Is she free? No right, no wrong, no rules for me, I'm free. That right there is our culture summed up. That right there is the sexual revolution summed up. I don't know if Frozen knew that. Maybe they're depicting it. But what happened? <laughs> what happened? She was destroying the city. She was destroying the city. But at the end of the movie, we learned something. Her power does have great beauty. It's meant for the other. It's meant to become a gift of love. She channeled it in love. And it redeemed the world. That right there is the call of all of us. We have three options to do with our longing. And Benedict says it, it's never going to be erased. And sometimes we think it's a curse. That's what Elsa thought. This thing is a curse. But it actually becomes the very channel of life and love. Not repress, not to indulge, but to purify. Right here, marriage, the one flesh union of man and woman. St. Paul says, is a great mystery. The one flesh union of man and woman in truth and love, the communion of persons is an image of God who is a communion of persons. But I want to say this, God is not sexual. God is pure spirit, but our sexuality images the one who is pure spirit, a communion of persons in God. And we're an image of that here on earth. 
John Paul II says, man becomes an image of God, not so much in the moment of solitude as in the moment of communion. We're made for communion. We're made for intimacy. I'm now going to share with you what John Paul II says in his Theology of the Body is the crowning of all scripture. And he quotes St. Paul, Ephesians 5, 31 through 32. John Paul II literally says in his Theology of the Body, right here is the crowning it is what God wants to say to you and I above anything else. John Paul II said that. Guess what? I want you to open these ears of yours. Okay? Open those ears, right? And hear this. John Paul the St. Paul says this. A man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a great mystery. And I say this in reference to Christ and his church. Pause. John, St. Paul is saying the one flesh union of man and woman is a great mystery. Right here is a great mystery. Why? It refers to Christ and his church. Jesus, Jesus leaves his father in heaven. He leaves his mother on earth in the culmination of his mission. This is my body given for you. Jesus says, I'm the bridegroom. I'm the bridegroom. Who's the church? The bride of Christ. And the fulfillment of his mission is, this is my body. This is my body given for you. Why? So that you may have life. St. Augustine says this, Jesus mounts the marriage bed of the cross. Not a bed of pleasure, but one of pain to give up his body before his bride, for his bride. And who's below the cross? Woman. He calls her woman. He doesn't call her mother. He doesn't call her Mary. He calls her woman. And theologians always knew, the early church fathers always knew, that's the new Eve. That's the new Eve. Woman. Woman. And what? And St. Augustine says, what does the woman do? The woman receives perfectly the gift of the bridegroom. Mary is the mother in the flesh. She's mother. But in the spirit, the church says she is the bride. Who is the bride? The one that opens. The bride is the one that opens to receive. What did, what did Simeon say to Mary at the circumcision of Jesus? Mary, your soul is going to be pierced. What happened at the foot of the cross? The lance pierced Jesus' side. A spiritual lance pierced Mary's heart. And Augustine says this, the blood and water is the spiritual seed that the woman receives and Jesus says, woman, behold your son. This union is fruitful. The church has recognized that this is a mystical marriage of Christ and his church. Mary is the representative, the model, on behalf of all of us who consented. Yes, come down. Yes, be with us. And St. Paul says this, the one flesh union is a great mystery. Why? Because it's meant to. The very purpose of why we are male and female is to be a, a window pointing, a sign to the real marriage we want. John Paul II says this. You want to know why you're male and female? He says, in Christ's sacrifice, the reason why we are male and female is fully revealed. In the beginning, it was created to be a foreshadowing an image into the eternal marriage. What do they call it? The wedding feast of the Lamb. Genesis begins in a garden with man and woman. Revelations, the end of Scripture. God and humanity wed, marry. Wait, God is Father, but He is bridegroom. He is lover. He is lover. What is the mass? What does the priest say? Blessed are those called to the supper of the lamb. Another translation. Blessed are those who are called to the wedding feast of the lamb. What happens at mass? I learned this from my mentor. We get grapes. Grapes are the crushed ovary of the grape plant. What is bread? It is the crushed endosperm of wheat. We bring the fertility of creation 
Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread and wine we offer you, fruit of the earth and work of human hands. It will come the bread of life. What is the chalice? The chalice comes from the Latin calyx of a flower. The calyx is the bottom cup of a flower where the dew falls. What does the priest say? Holy Spirit, come down upon these gifts like the dew fall. Why? So that they may have life. He unveils it. He unveils the chalice. What happens at a wedding? I had this in prayer. What happens at a wedding? The bridegroom is at the front of the altar. He's probably looking pretty sharp. <laughs> and he sees his beautiful bride, traditionally with a veil over her face. And I had this in prayer of maybe my future wedding day. What, what would happen in my heart? Excitement, joy. My best friend got married and he was quivering and he was crying. He couldn't handle emotionally the beauty of what was about to happen. What was his bride feeling inside? Joy, life, that's, that's, the, that's my man. That's the one I desire. That's the one I long for. And traditionally, the bridegroom unveils the bride to enter into the mystery. What happens at mass? The eternal bridegroom, who we should, we should long for more than anything else, is in the person of Christ, the priest, in persona Christi, standing at the front of the altar as he sees the church, the bride, walk down the aisle. This is my body for you. So that we may have life. Wait, wait, wait. Jesus says to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven unless you are born again. Does that mean I have to go back to my mom's womb? He said, Nicodemus, what are you talking about? You don't know the scriptures. What does he mean? You have to be regenerated. Baptism. The church says baptism is the nuptial bath. What do I mean by that? That was a big term. Jews, the Jewish bridegroom and bride, before they got married, the bride would bathe in what they call the nuptial bath to present to herself, to be cleansed, to be washed, to enter into the wedding feast. The church says baptism is the nuptial bath. It's also described as the womb where we are regenerated. And the church says to prepare ourselves for the wedding feast, mass, which is a foretaste of the wedding feast of the Lamb in heaven. What? John Paul II then says this, when a man and woman become one flesh, they become one flesh in the sexual embrace. When God and humanity become one flesh, they become one flesh in the Eucharist. Oh my gosh. The saints knew this. The saints knew this. I'm going to tell you one story about Blessed Amelda. Blessed Amelda Lambertini is one of my favorite blessed, blesseds. <laughs> blessed Amelda was eight years old, Bologna, Italy, 1300s. She wanted to receive Jesus in the Eucharist. She said to her priest, I want to receive Jesus. Blessed, or not blessed, Amelda, Amelda. <laughs> you can't receive him yet. You have to be 12 or 13 years old. That was, the, at that time, you had to be 12 or 13 to receive. She was, okay, okay, I'll wait. She said this, she kept saying this, how can anyone receive Jesus and not die? How could anyone receive Jesus and not die? She became 11 years old and entered the Dominican order as a novice. She told the priest, I want to receive Jesus. I want to receive Jesus. Amelda, just one more year. One day after mass, when she was 11 years old, everyone left and she was praying by herself. The nuns in the other room smelled a fragrance of roses. Where's this coming from? They followed it to the chapel where they saw Melda on her knees and above her head was levitating a Eucharistic host. Get the priest, get the priest, what the heck's going on? Get the priest, they got the priest, the priest came in. She's ready. <laughs> Grabs the Eucharist. The body of Christ gives her the Eucharist. She entered this ecstasy and died. She died? Why? Our finite humanity, our lowly finite humanity, cannot contain infinite love. This was an, an extraordinary experience that we all do. If we saw the glory of God right now, you would die. Blessed Amelda was taken up into infinite love. 
It was consuming her being so much it couldn't take it. She died in ecstasy. What is it that we believe as Catholics? What is heaven? St. Francis of Assisi, Lord, I want to hear heaven's song. I want to hear heaven's song. I want to hear what the angels and saints are singing to you. Francis, Francis, if you heard heaven's song, it's so beauty, you would die. Fine, give me one note. Give me one note. An angel appeared to Francis with a harp. Francis, this is what we sing praise to God. Strings one note, and Francis falls into a coma of ecstasy for two days. He wakes up and he tells his brothers, if I heard one more note, I would have died out of the beauty of the music. What? What is heaven? Catherine of Siena, she would receive the Eucharist and be in the pews for hour, 24 hours. The priest would have to sometimes refuse because he, know, he knew she would go to the pews and be in ecstasy for over 24 hours. What are they teaching us? They're teaching that you can enter into that. You may not be floating up in the ceiling, but you can absolutely <laughs> enter into this. I don't know about your story of where you've been with your desires and longings. I don't know. But the Catholic Church says the fulfillment of Eros, the longing for the true, the good, and beautiful, is the Eucharist. The longing of Eros, the fire we feel in our bones, our body and soul, is the Eucharist, where we become one bread, one body, one Lord of all. One body. One body with God. That's what we believe. Theology of the body, John Paul II says, isn't just some ordinary just teaching. It's the very mystery of Christmas. It's the very mystery of Christianity where God, the Word, became flesh. Theology enters the body through the main door so that we can not just pray to him up there, but that John says in his Gospels that I can see with my eyes, touch with my hands, that I proclaim the Word of life. We get to, that's what we believe. God's not a tyrant. God's the one who knelt down before you to serve you. I had this image in mass today earlier, and I don't know if I've been doing this, honestly. I had this whisper that said, have you allowed the Lord to be your servant? I'm like, no, I've been serving him. And that's good. But if we first aren't receiving the gift, we can never give it. Not at this moment. That's, that's God. God's the one who, who, will, who serves. He washes our feet. This is our God. I want to conclude by sharing a story about Peter. Oh, Peter. St. Peter. Not Peter Pan. What are you thinking, Peter Pan? Oh, not Peter. No. <laughs> Peter. St. Peter. Because what was Peter? Peter was a guy on action. He wanted to do. He wanted, I want to die for you, Lord. Oh, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. No, I won't. No, I won't. I'm going all the way. I'm going all the way. Okay. What happens? Denies him three times. And he goes away crying. Think about this. Peter, his best friend, he denies him. And the way in which he denied him, I don't know you, to his best friend. And then he dies, and he doesn't ever get to say sorry. That's what's probably going on in his head. I couldn't say sorry. And Jesus looks at him when he resurrects and says, peace be with you. And then he has breakfast with him. He reconciles three acts of betrayal, and then it's three, Peter, do you love me? But I want to share with you the Greek. Maybe some of you know this. He says, Peter, Jesus says this to Peter, Peter, do you love me? And in Greek, it's Peter, do you agape me? Divine sacrificial love. And Peter says, Lord, you know I filia you. Low human love. Peter, Peter, do you agape me? Lord, Lord, you know I filia you. And then Jesus says, Peter, the third time, do you philia me? He says, you know I philia you. What's happening? God is coming down to our level. 
so that he may raise us up into agape. What does that mean? We don't have to do anything. Isn't that nice? To be holy. This, I'm going to share with you a little bit more about my prayer life. This was whispered into my ear a couple years ago, not a couple years, a couple days ago. Jesus said this to me, Brendan, holiness, what it means to become more and more like a saint is to just know that you're loved. There are places in my heart that disbelieve I'm loved. And holiness, what a saint is, is their whole heart, most of their heart, knows that they are so loved. That's it. That's what it means to be a saint. That's what he's trying to tell Peter. Peter, you are going to do great things. But can you just listen? Can you just allow yourself to be loved by me? That's prayer. Be not afraid. Be not afraid. Jesus said this over and over and over. Be not afraid to jump on the train. Be not afraid to jump on the train. John Paul II, he always said the same thing. Be not afraid to the world. And one time someone asked him, John Paul II, you say that so much. Be not afraid. Be not afraid. What do you mean? Be not afraid of what? And he said, be not afraid of who you are. Be not afraid of who you are. 